Chapter 1. After a Loved One Passes I stood outside my sister's house that cold March morning, trying to understand how everything had changed. Police cars lined the driveway. An ambulance drove away and a coroner drove up. How was this possible? We had all been together the night before eating Sunday dinner at my mom's house. Could it really be true that my sister was dead? What do you think happened? I looked at my mom, shivering. Neither of us had grabbed a coat in our urgent dash to my sister's house on the other side of town. Mom shrugged and shook her head. When do you think the police will let us in? I asked, wrapping my arms tightly around myself. Time seemed to be going backward. How long had we been outside her house? An hour? Two hours? What do you think happened? I asked again. Look! Mom pointed to Maria's wraparound porch. There's a pileated woodpecker. It's been there since I got here. The large bird with its vibrant red head stood on the railing just a few feet from the police officer standing outside the door. Mom kept her eyes on the bird. It's rare to see them, she said. How strange one would be here now with all these people. I looked at the big black bird with the bright red head. A red head. Like my sister, I thought. The police officer signaled that we could go inside. It's what happens when a young person dies at home, she explained. It's protocol to take pictures and investigate. All normal. Normal? How was any of this normal? I walked into the house and saw my brother-in-law for the first time. She didn't wake up, he said, putting his hands over his face. As Maria's house filled with relatives, friends, and neighbors, I looked at the green cupcakes Maria must have made the night before to go to her youngest daughter's second-grade class and remembered it was St. Patrick's Day. Out the window, a dash of red caught my eye. The pileated woodpecker again. It had moved from the porch to an oak right outside the living room. Over the next weeks, grief consumed me. I missed my sister's daily phone calls. I missed everything about her. She was my best friend, my oldest sister. I was lost without her, confused by what had happened, and angry that God hadn't given us the opportunity to pray for another outcome. Even the autopsy was a disappointment. According to all the tests, my sister was healthy. She hadn't died of a heart attack or an aneurysm, as we had thought. She had just died in her sleep. The abrupt loss without a known cause made it feel as if Maria had simply vanished, as if she had disappeared in the night. God, please send a sign, I prayed. Something so I know she's not gone. On a cold May morning, the day of my niece's college graduation, I woke up and poured myself a cup of coffee. Maria would love to be here today, I thought. She would be so proud to see her oldest daughter graduate. She'd have a huge party to celebrate. Instead, I was driving Mom to the ceremony, and my husband was staying home to get our house ready for my niece's graduation party. My niece's college was about an hour away. As I drove down the road, the weight of my sister missing this milestone grew heavier. With each mile, I felt myself fighting back tears. Mom and I were about halfway there, as the winding rural roads brought us to a small city. Slow down, Mom said. There's a light coming up. Maria should be here, I said. As I came to a stop, I saw something swoop down and land on the shoulder of the road in front of us. A pileated woodpecker. The large, red, white, and black bird stood right where it had landed and looked at us. Mom and I stared right back, hardly believing our eyes. The light turned green, and, as if on cue, the large bird took flight. I didn't see which way it flew, but I knew that whether it followed our car or not, my sister was with us in spirit. Since that day, a pileated woodpecker has visited me a number of times. One perched in a tree in front of our house on Christmas Day. Another appeared and waited for the bus on the day my son began kindergarten. Another flew overhead at a memorial gathering for my sister, and once when I was going through a hard time, one even pecked at my bedroom window, persistently tapping on the sill until I woke up. There are still days when I'm overcome with grief and miss my sister deeply, but I'm comforted to know that she didn't disappear like a thief in the night. I know Maria is in God's care. A big red-headed bird told me so. Just a few minutes ago, the familiar tap-tap-tapping staccato knocked on my window. I looked up to see the scarlet red head of the pileated woodpecker and said, Good to see you. All right, all right. Message received. The big bird stopped and flew away, disappearing behind the ledge of cedars. 
I've come to understand that after we lose a loved one, extraordinary things happen, things that bring us comfort, things that might begin with, this will sound a little crazy, but things that don't make sense in earthly ways. The nine stories in this chapter share a common, heavenly thread of the miraculous, a thread that mends the grieving heart. Amazing experiences, like Carol Holderby Gimbel's honest-to-goodness phone calls from heaven, and the way a loved one is honored in an unlikely way in The Man in White. Rick Hamlin shares a beautiful story about his grandmother's direct flight to heaven, and also tells how his brother-in-law, the sole survivor of a tragic accident, has divine knowledge that his deceased friends are okay on the other side. Without logical explanations for these occurrences, it seems only rational to look to heaven for the answer. Perhaps thin places of grief occur after a loved one passes because our hearts are open in loss. We're deeply open to receive God's messages that reassure love has no limits. These messages strengthen our faith and bind our sorrows and tell us again and again that death is not the end. Taking Mom Home by Jan Weeks The golden light of sunset reflected in the window of the nursing home, turning the scarlet amaryllis on the sill into a pillar of flame. It was 4.30 on a January Friday, and I was waiting for my mother to die. The call had come at one that afternoon. "'Your mother's in a bad way. We've called the doctor,' the nurse had said. "'You'd better come right away.' I held medical power of attorney, which gave me the right to make decisions about my mother's health care, and she and I had spent hours talking about her wishes. "'I don't want to live as a vegetable,' she'd insisted." Don't let them keep me alive on machines, and don't spend a lot of money on a fancy funeral. I want to be cremated. Scatter my ashes under the Colorado aspen. Now I had to honor her wishes. Sure, she could be rehydrated and possibly live for another week, but at what price? As I set the receiver down, I knew I had to make the most difficult decision I'd ever face. I picked up the phone once more. I dialed the doctor's office and spoke with her physician. It's time to let her go. Just make sure she's comfortable. He agreed. Jean's not in any pain. There's something more than dehydration going on. She may be bleeding internally, and she may have suffered a heart attack, but she's not in any pain, he repeated. I sat beside her bed, stroking her hand and talking to her about all the good times we'd had and what a good mother she'd been. Mom was one of the strongest women I'd ever known. Widowed twice by the time she was thirty-two, she raised three girls without the help of relatives, friends, or welfare. She went back to school nights and weekends to get her teaching degree. Sometimes Mom would tell us stories about her father, who had died when I was seven. Whenever she talked about him, her face lit up, and laughter came easily as she remembered fishing trips, autumn excursions to fill gunny sacks with black walnuts, and spring walks to find the first violets. She particularly enjoyed telling us how much he had loved us and how proud he would be of how we'd turned out. Now, even though she couldn't move, her eyes followed me as I talked, and I knew she understood. Then slowly she began to fade. She stared at the wall, her chest rising with effort. I wondered how much longer she could struggle to keep her death at bay. Tears filled my eyes as I watched her. I would give anything to make her transition easier. But what could I do? I did the only thing I knew might help. I prayed. Dear God. But there I floundered. God seemed so big, so far away. I bowed my head again. This time the words came easily. Daddy? I whispered. She waited so long for you. Can't you help her now? Peace flowed over me, and I felt the presence. Oh, Daddy, I said softly. A light seemed to shine from Mom as she took another breath. As I waited for her to exhale, I could picture Daddy reaching out to her, welcoming her to heaven. Mom's chest rose and fell, then rose again. The light of her spirit blinked out of her eyes, and I knew my prayer had been answered. The Living Among the Dead by Rick Hamlin The old family plot is in a cemetery at the base of the brown and purple mountains of my childhood. I hadn't seen the cemetery in a long time when it appeared in a TV show, the white moss-covered angels rising above the gravestones, crosses, and granite plaques memorializing the dead, a perfect backdrop for a drama about a family of undertakers. I knew kids when I was younger who claimed that cemeteries were creepy places, 
havens of ghosts and demons, harborers of bad luck if you didn't watch yourself, muttering imprecations against the dead or running for dear life if you walked across the wrong grave. I never believed them. Still don't. For the cemetery I visited most in my childhood was an enchanted place of old oaks, trimming hedges, mowed lawns, meandering paths, roses, azaleas, and camellia bushes, and glimpses of family history and names and dates inscribed on old stones. The ghost of memory might have haunted the minds of my paternal grandparents, who took me there most often. But the stories they shared were comforting reminders of the past that was with us and the loved ones who couldn't be forgotten. I loved holding my grandmother's hand and hearing her explain who was buried under which stone, relatives I had never known, people who, from the dates I read, when I was old enough to read, had died what seemed like ages ago, although now I'm sure the years would not seem so distant. Who was that? I asked. And that? She was the youngest of a large family and could tell me about the uncles, aunts, cousins, and siblings of hers who were only fading images in black and white photos. That is your great grandfather, she explained. He was once the mayor of the town when it was young and the founder of a lumber company, but long before, he had been a drummer boy in the Civil War. I ran my fingers along the birth and death dates and tried to figure out how old he had been when he was in the Civil War. Not much older than me, it seemed. My grandfather had been in the Navy in World War I and was a proud member of the American Legion. On Memorial Day, the cemetery was filled with small flags that marked the graves of veterans who had served in many wars. People he must have known. We, his grandchildren, weren't knowledgeable enough to know where to put the flags, but at the end of the day he sent us across the wide green lawns to collect the flags, pulling them up from the mud, gathering as many as we could. "'You old stick in the mud,' he called my brother and me, a nickname I couldn't quite parse until I pulled up a recalcitrant flag from a damp corner of the cemetery, dusting off the dirt with my small hands, thinking maybe this was what he was referring to. Cemeteries are indeed thin places if you will let them be.' War cemeteries can be overpowering, like the ones at Gettysburg or Normandy, where there are seemingly endless lines of crosses and occasional stars of David, reminders of the soldiers who lost their young lives in the cause of freedom. But then again, those crosses and stars of David are reminders of faith, of the world beyond. Do we not visit cemeteries to be reminded not just of the dead, but of the life everlasting? Isn't that the point of the marble angels, the statues of Jesus? the biblical words carved in stone, I am the resurrection and the life. When I think of it, the woman who saw the resurrected Christ on that first Easter, when the stone was rolled away, were visiting a gravesite in mourning, bringing spices for a dead body, only to be greeted by an empty tomb. Cemeteries can still offer in bittersweet surroundings such joyful surprises. Why do you look for the living among the dead, said the men in dazzling clothes that Easter morning. He is not here. But he has risen. Luke 24, verses 5 and 6. My paternal grandmother outlived her husband by only 18 months, often visiting the grave where he lay. I can imagine the comfort she found in that, bringing bouquets of flowers picked from her garden, the stems wrapped in wax paper or aluminum foil. The last time she went was May Day, and surely she had some of the first roses of the season with her. I can see her hands, those hands that often held me and smelled sweetly of lavender, like her skin and hair, arranging the flowers in a small vase and patting down the earth around the polished stone. The weather was warm, and she would have had to walk far from the bus stop to the old family plot. The mists of May would have shielded the mountains in the morning, but they would have risen by the afternoon, and with their absence the cooling breeze would come in. She lay down in the sun. She was a grandmother who always believed in naps. At the end of the day, she was still there, stretched out on the grass in front of her forebears, her family, her husband. I thought she was sleeping, the caretaker later told my dad. She often would rest in the sun. We left her to herself. I'm sorry. His words trailed off. I can picture the bewilderment and pain. It was a terrible shock. Death always is, even when it's expected, anticipated, dreaded. She had been a wonderful mother, a favorite grandmother, a perfect mother-in-law, my mother always said. Modest, self-effacing, she had gone out in a way she would have favored, without much bother or fuss, and at the cemetery, where she would be buried next to her husband, the words of Scripture repeated right there. I can feel the pain and sorrow of it, even now, many years later, but I can also feel the wonder. 
an exit from one life with the promise of the next close by. It was what an old friend of mine used to call a direct flight. No wonder I think of that place as holy. People who love me still feel close by. They are gone, but never really gone from me. They lived and loved and believed and passed on their faith. That's something I can feel on every visit. The Man in White by Gail Thorell Schelling I usually loved the high energy of this place, but not now. I needed quiet, not all this racket. Only the day before I had buried my father. But I had promised my daughter Trina a trip to Boston to buy some clothes, and today, on a sunny Labor Day weekend, was our last chance. She loved the ethnic foods at Quincy Market, so here we were, elbowing our way through the mobs of people with our styrofoam boxes. Buskers jiggled clubs for applauding crowds, and artists twisted skinny balloons into animal shapes for colorful headgear. Honky-tonk piano and sax competed with folk guitar here and electric guitar there. Amid the cosmopolitan chatter of many languages, international students from Boston's many colleges laughed and photographed each other as they dodged skateboarders and baby strollers. Once seated outside with my moussaka, a Greek eggplant dish, I had little appetite. Dad's funeral weighed on my mind. Things had happened too fast. My children driving across country weren't able to arrive in time. Not only was the service in an unfamiliar church with an unfamiliar pastor, the organist, also a stranger, hadn't provided the music I'd requested. He had substituted Ave Maria by Gounod for the Ave Maria by Schubert, the one my father, a one-time Lutheran, had once confided he liked. How I wished I could have given Daddy that final musical tribute. Ah, well, nothing to be done now. I was poking at my eggplant when I heard a tenvol of sound. Just as quickly it disappeared, drowned by a roar from the unicyclist crowd. He had moved into juggling lawn chairs. Do you hear that, Trina? What? When I heard the sweet music again, I left Trina to follow it. Again, it disappeared as a siren pierced the afternoon. Insubstantial as smoke, the melody wafted through the racket, then vanished in the noise. I pushed past scores of people, stopped, listened, and pushed them more until I tracked down the mysterious fragments of melody. Near a pushcart of Red Sox souvenirs, a man dressed in pure white played a violin in the hubbub. Now, no one but no one wears white pants in Boston after Labor Day. This alone struck me as peculiar, but the best was yet to come. As I moved close enough to hear the man in white clearly, I recognized the waterfall of notes yearning and receding, the achingly familiar arpeggio of Schubert's Ave Maria. Dad had his final musical tribute after all.